let's clarify what recursion is. By definition, recursion is a way to solve a reoccurring problem by repeatedly solving similar subproblems. In programming, we can have recursive functions. A function is recursive if it calls itself. The call can happen directly, like in this case, or indirectly if the function calls another function, which in turn invokes the first function. We'll often encounter recursive data structures too. A data structure is recursive if you can describe it in terms of itself. For example, a linked list can be described as a list node followed by a linked list. All right, let's implement a recursive data structure. So here's a simple node class. Each node can link to the next node through the next property. The node also holds a value of type string. Finally, I provide an initializer which sets the value properly. Now that we have our node type, let's build a linked list. First, I create each node and assign it a value that matches its name. Then, I set the property of each node to form a linked list. The next node for node 1 is node 2. For node 2, the next node will be node 3. And finally, I end the linked list by setting the next node for node 3 to nil. Now, let's implement a function that traverses the linked list and prints the value in each node. I'm going to call the function parse nodes. The parse nodes function takes an argument of type node. This is the first node from where we want to traverse the list. If the input node is nil, I return from the function. Otherwise, I print the value of the given node. Next, I call the parse nodes method recursively by passing in the next node. And finally, I call the parse nodes function with the first node as input parameter. The console shows the expected values. Since the data structure is recursive, I was able to iterate through it using a recursive function. Recursion won't necessarily produce faster or more efficient code, but it usually provides an elegant alternative to iterative approaches and requires fewer lines of code. So far, we've seen some examples of recursive functions and data structures. Now, let's check out how recursion works. I'm going to calculate the factorial of a positive integer n. This is a problem that can be solved using recursion since the factorial is defined as the product of the integers from 1 to n. So here's the swift factorial function that calculates the factorial of a positive integer. The function takes an unsigned integer as argument. If the input parameter is smaller than 2, the function returns 1. Otherwise, the function returns the product of the input and the result of calling the function with an argument that is smaller by 1. The recursive calls continue until the function gets called with a value that is smaller than 2. To understand how recursion works, here's a graphical representation of what's going on when calculating factorial of 3. Whenever a nested call happens, the execution of the former call is suspended and its state is stored. A snapshot of its context, that is, its code, input parameters, and local variables is persisted. All this information is stored in a structure known as call stack or execution stack. The call stack is a stack structure that keeps track of the point where control should be returned after a subroutine finishes its execution. When the nested call is finished executing, its context is destroyed and the control is returned to the caller. Eventually, we get back to the very first function call. All the nested contexts are destroyed by then and the final result is returned to the caller. Now, let's switch to Xcode. I've gone ahead and created a playground project. Let's start by implementing a function that calculates the factorial of a positive integer n. The function takes a 64-bit unsigned integer as argument and it also returns this type. 
This problem can be solved using recursion since the factorial is defined as the product of the integers from 1 to n. The factorial of 1 and 0 is 1, so we return 1 for input smaller than 2. Otherwise, the function returns the product of the input and the result of calling the function with an argument that is smaller by 1. Alright, let's try out our function. And indeed, factorial of 3 is 6. Now, let's try it with a bigger number, let's say with 10. Alright, now let's try it with 20. And how about 30? Oops, we've got an error. This is because the result would be bigger than the maximum value that can be represented using an unsigned 64-bit integer. I print out unsigned in 64 max to the console. So this is the biggest number that we can represent using a 64-bit unsigned integer. And the factorial of 21 is already bigger than that. Now, there is no support for big integers in Swift. Yet, there is a big int prototype in the official Swift repository. You can find it in the master Swift repo under test prototypes. I select raw, then save the page as a Swift source file. Next, I'm going to add it to our playground project. We don't need this import, and I also get rid of the tests, except this type alias. Now I can use the begint type. So let's refactor our factorial function. I'm going to use begint for the input argument, also begint for the return type. Now let's try out our new function. It already works with 30, so we can even increase the value further. And the result will be a huge number, as you will see in a moment. Hopefully, we'll see the begin type soon in the official Swift library. Until then, you can use it, but it's at your own risk. Recursion is great, but it doesn't come without pitfalls. The biggest problem is infinite recursion. I'm going to illustrate it using an Xcode Playground project. I implement a function which calculates the sum of the first n positive integers. I call the function batsum to make it clear that it's not the right approach to solve this problem. I show you the right solution that relies on a simple formula in an upcoming lesson. So batsum accepts an input parameter n of type int and returns an integer. We'll use a recursive approach. The function returns the sum of the input parameter and the result of calling itself with an argument that is smaller by 1. All right, now let's try it with, say, 3. Eventually, a runtime error occurs. To understand the root cause, let's quickly recap how recursion works. Each time a nested call occurs, a record of the current context is made and added as a new stack frame to the top of the stack. And each time a call returns, the top stack frame is removed. The stack is a special part of the memory used for fast static allocations. Each application has a stack, and multi-threaded applications have one stack per thread. The stack has a finite size. Thus, if we keep calling nested functions and none of these functions returns, we'll run out of available stack space. When the memory available for the call stack is exceeded, the app will crash with a stack overflow error. Let's inspect our batsum function. There is no condition that prevents executing the nested call over and over again. I'm going to slightly change the code to print the value of the input argument whenever we call the function. Now, we can clearly see that the execution doesn't stop after two recursive calls as it should. What that means is that the nested contexts are not destroyed and the stack frames are not removed. We keep allocating memory on the stack without deallocating it, 
which eventually leads to the Stack Overflow exception. To avoid infinite recursion, each recursive function needs to have at least one condition that prevents further nested calls to itself. This condition is called base case. So let's go back to the batsum function and add the missing base case. The issue is that batsum calls itself as we keep decreasing the input argument n. We need a base case here, that is, a condition which makes the function return without performing another recursive call. We're only interested in the sum of positive integers, so if the input argument is 0, we can simply return 0. If I run the function after this change, it produces the expected result. But does this check really work for all input values? Let's check it with minus 1. Nope. Since I only check for 0, the function will cause a runtime crash for negative input. We must also ensure that the function actually progresses towards the base case. I need to modify the base case so that it covers not only the value 0, but also negative values. Now, this conditional statement will work. Yet, a guard statement is a better fit because it forces us to exit the function. Note that some programming languages have built-in checks to prevent stack overflows. Remember these rules when you implement recursive solutions in Swift. And don't forget to check your recursive functions thoroughly through unit tests that cover also edge cases.